Hello, I'm Emily Rhodes, and today I'm going to be talking to you about this book, Out Stealing Horses by Per Pettersson, and it's translated by Anne Bourne. This is a brilliant book, and it's an incredibly powerful book, and the prose is kind of muscular and beautiful and really captures um, this feeling of uh, a, the summer when, when everything changed, this, this moment of impact on your life. Um, I am going to talk about it, I hope, without revealing any spoilers, so don't worry if you've not read this book yet. Um, but I will say that something quite major happens about 50 pages in, and if you are feeling a bit vulnerable, maybe this isn't the right time to read this book. Um, I'm not going to tell you what happens, um, but it's quite violent and shocking. And when I, the reason I'm not going to tell you about it, even though that makes it incredibly hard to discuss the books that happened so early on, um, is that, you know, when I first sat down to read this, it really, it was like a kind of punch in the gut, that moment. And I want it to have that impact on you. It's, it's so unusual for a book to really kind of hit you like that. Um, and I think this book really succeeds in doing that. So, um, you know, be prepared. Um, but, but, you know, hopefully, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, but something happens. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read a bit out. I'm going to talk about a couple of things that spring to mind as I've been reading it. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are reading this as the April book for Emily's Walking Book Club. We are an international community of readers. Um, we're now at about two and a half thousand all over the world. And we meet every month um, in three ways. We meet to walk on Hampstead Heath and talk about a book to walk in Regent's Park. And we also meet on Zoom on Monday evenings for those who kind of can't get to London parks to walk. Um, I also have a newsletter every Monday that I send out to you for free. Um, you can sign up to that. It's just emilyswalkingbookclub.substack.com. There's loads of kind of links about the book and, and other things on there. Um, so also just to tell you, for those who've recognised I'm not in my kind of native surroundings here, you know, I have no surfing knowledge at all. Um, we're in Devon on holiday, rented a little cottage. This is the shed at the bottom of the garden, which is like this sort of quiet, peaceful refuge from from the chaos of the cottage filled with three children and a dog. Um, this is um, kind of a little bit <laughs> what this shed looks like, although this shed is much less dilapidated. And um, that is also why I look like this. You know, I've got kind of beachy hair and I've lost my hairbrush. And um, I know we've been, I'm sort of covered in sand. <laughs> We've been on the beach every day in, in all weathers, um, having kind of sandy picnics, um, sandy damp picnics, but it's, it's, like it's been absolute heaven. Um, and Alfie, our puppy, has, has loved his time on the beach, uh, as have the children. So, out stealing horses. Um, this book begins in... Um, you know, it's kind of present day is just coming up to New Year's Eve of the millennium. And Trond, the main character, is 67. And he is in isolation. You know, he's in this... Well, actually, well, he's not in this shed, but he, he's, in a, he's in a shed kind of thing. in a sort of run-down house, kind of in the middle of nowhere, except he does have one neighbour. Um, and the book begins when he meets his neighbour, um he's out looking for his dog and it's obviously a big deal for him to talk to someone he's really seeking isolation and solitude and I think that that's a really big theme in the book this idea of wanting to be alone um as opposed to loneliness um and, and the difference between those um but he, meet, he meets this neighbor and then comes in feels completely shell-shocked by it and then has a flashback to this really important summer of his youth when he was 15. And the rest of the book unfolds as a double narrative. So you have the the present day chapters of um, him as 67, kind of 
coming to terms with everything that's happened in his life. Um, and this summer of 1948, when he's 15, and, you know, that's the first, the first big thing, this kind of coming of age moment. And I'm going to read to you from um, the first time it goes back to, to that summer. It's chapter two. We were going out stealing horses. That was what he said, standing at the door to the cabin when I was spending the summer with my father. I was 15. It was 1948 and one of the first days of July. Three years earlier, the Germans had left, but I can't remember that we talked about them any longer. At least my father did not. He never said anything about the war. John came often to our door at all hours, wanting me to go out with him, shooting hares, walking through the forest in the pale moonlight, right up to the top of the ridge, when it was perfectly quiet, fishing for trout in the river, balancing on the shining yellow logs that still sailed the current close to our cabin, long after the clearing of the river was done. It was risky, but I never said no, and never said anything to my father about what we were up to. We could see a stretch of the river from the kitchen window, but it was not there that we did our balancing acts. We always started further down, nearly a kilometre, and sometimes we went so far and so fast on the logs that it took us an hour to walk back through the forest, when at last we had scrambled onto the bank, soaking wet and shivering. John wanted no company but mine. He had two younger brothers, the twins, Lars and Odd, but he and I were the same age. I do not know who he was with for the rest of the year when I was in Oslo. He never talked about that and I never told him what I did in the city. He never knocked, just came quietly up the path from the river where his little boat was tied up and waited at the door until I became aware that he was there. It never took long. Even in the morning early when I was still asleep, I might feel a restlessness far into my dream as if I needed to pee and struggle to wake up before it was too late. And then when I opened my eyes and knew it wasn't that, I went directly to the door and opened it, and there he was. He smiled his little smile and squinted, as he always did. Are you coming? he said. We're going out stealing horses. It turned out that we meant only him and me as usual, and if I had not gone with him, he would have gone alone, and that would have been no fun. Besides, it was hard to steal horses alone. Impossible, in fact. Have you been waiting long, I said. I just got here. That's what he always said, and I never knew if it was true. I stood on the doorstep in only my underpants and looked over his shoulder. It was already light. There were wisps of mist on the river, and it was a little cold. It would soon warm up, but now I felt goose pimples spread over my thighs and stomach. Yet I stood there looking down to the river, watching it coming from round the bend a little further up, shining and soft from under the mist and flow past. I knew it by heart. I dreamt about it all winter. Which horses, I said. Barkald's horses. He keeps them in the paddock in the forest behind the farm. I know. Come inside while I get dressed. I'll wait here, he said. He never would come inside, maybe because of my father. He never spoke to my father, never said hello to him just looked down when they passed each other on the way to the shop. Then my father would stop and turn around to look at him and say, wasn't that John? Yes, I said. What's wrong with him? Said my father every time, as if embarrassed. And each time I said, I don't know. And in fact, I did not and never thought to ask. Now John stood on the doorstep that was only a flagstone, gazing down at the river while I fetched my clothes from the back of one of the tree trunk chairs and pulled them on as quickly as I could. I did not like him having to stand there waiting, even though the door was open, so he could see me the whole time. So you can see, I hope, from that, that it's so atmospheric about, you know, the river and nature and the summer. Um, you feel like something's going to happen. I should say that out stealing horses isn't actually stealing horses, kind of leaping onto them like Zorro does um, and, and riding them bareback as long as you can and um, you know perhaps you can see there's sort of clues to, to something mysterious something kind of slightly unknown going on um, you know why doesn't John talk to his father ever is that just adolescent weirdness or, or is it something else and I do think um, this book 
captures that half knowledge of childhood and adolescence so well that feeling of being a teenager or you know was sort of nearly a teenager you know yeah he's 15 but I think that feeling starts maybe a little earlier um of of being half in an adult world you know having a foot in the adult world so you you you're witness to quite a lot but you only you understand it you make sense of it in a in a childish way and that moment when it changes and you suddenly understand that adult significance of things it, it makes me think of um books like the go-between or or spies by michael frain you know where again a, a child is kind of embroiled in this adult situation and makes sense of it as a game and then suddenly it, it becomes clear that it, it's not a game it's something much more grown up um and i think that's very similar here it also really made me think about how much we carry around with us, you know, this this moment from adolescence or childhood that, that has such an impact and is buried you know, for, for sort of half a century. And then it just suddenly comes to the surface again, um, sparked in this instance by, but you know, by this encounter with his neighbour and we soon discover the, the significance of that. But, you know, I wonder if, if that rings true for any of you, if you've had, um, you know, moments in your adult life where you see someone from who you haven't seen since childhood and it sort of transports you back there with a jolt. Um, for me, that sometimes happens with place, you know, with going back somewhere that you haven't been for a very long time and you're suddenly in that world and, and in that part of yourself again. Um, of course, like in therapy, that's a, a real thing, isn't it? You sort of try and go back into that moment and sort of relive it um, to, to, <laughs> to to process the trauma. Um, and I do, you know, it's 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 a very it's very interesting that you know, as humans, we all we all carry a lot with us, and that we think it's all buried within, but actually it, it can explode to the surface. And then this, um, you know, in this book, as a result of that, there's this double narrative where he's both living in the present tense and having these these kind of flashbacks. But as, as a reader, you're experiencing these this trip back to that summer. And I mean, I, I actually, I really like that technique in novels of you know, into interlacing these two narratives. Um, and I wonder how you find that. Do you, and and it did it did also make me feel that actually, although, it, you know, I suppose, okay, I suppose sometimes one might say, oh, it's a bit contrived, you know, layering these two narratives like that. I don't say that, but I also think it actually speaks of a bigger truth that, maybe we are all living these double narratives all the time. You know, if I think about um, the me who is sort of looking after three children and a dog and, you know, making tea and doing laundry and, and kind of coping and talking to them, I'm, I'm very much in that headspace. And then at the same time, there's this other narrative going on in my life of my work and my writing and, um, you know, inhabiting... I don't know, either the book I'm reading or the book I'm you know, really slowly trying to write. Um, and I wonder if that feeling of doubleness feels true to you. Um, I think also often if we're going through quite a, a major process of, of grief or something like that, you know, it's very hard to live in the in the day-to-day -day reality of having to cope with the very practical things when emotionally you're in a kind of completely other world. Um, yes, I, I can think of other moments where, I, th I think it's often when you're coping with some sort of trauma, you know, you're there's the, the part of you that is trying to deal with this very deep emotional stuff and the other the part of you that's sort of superficially getting on. Anyway, Out Stealing Horses, Pear Patterson. Thank you.